Awesome. Well, welcome everyone again. We're going to go ahead and get started with the meeting. My name is Esther Waldra, Program Coordinator with the Food Council, and um, I will pass it along to Lorian to introduce herself, and then we can get started. Hi there. Yeah, um, Lorian McCauley, uh, the Agricultural and Sustainability Specialist here at the Food Council. Really looking forward to our um, conversation today um, and would love to go ahead and introduce those of us on the um, Montgomery County Food Council um, and board. Um, so I'm uh, wondering if I could go ahead and ask um, Angie, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Angie McCarthy. I am the uh, new Mar Maryland Conservation Advocate at Nature Forward, as well as a second term uh, Food Council board member and head beer. Lori, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Lori Savage. I am a member of the Montgomery County Food Council. Um, also work for Future Harvest. And I, on the farm, I'm with uh, Brown Cow Creamery. Thank you. And I'm just going down my screen. So um, if you can unmute um, Michelle Nelson, are you able to introduce yourself? Um, hi, everyone. Michelle Nelson. I manage the community gardens program with Montgomery Parks. Great. And um, wondering, Emma Lehman, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma Lehman. I work with Michelle um, as the assistant manager for Montgomery Parks community garden program. And I'm also a food council member. Great. And William Clemens, are you able to introduce yourself? Sorry, William Clemens, Director of Transportation, and I am on the advisory board and uh, a membership board. Wonderful. And have I missed any others of our council and board members? Okay, great. Well, yeah, and as Esther um, said, if everybody else can go ahead and introduce themselves in their chat, um, name, title, affiliation, whether or not you're a pumpkin or apple cider person. So, great. Um, so, Thanks, without Marianne. further ado, back to Esther. Thanks. Yes, um, just a few dates for folks to keep in mind, um, and I'm going to drop the events page link right here for any specific registration um, links. We have our uh, Moco micro cold Moco micro hub cold storage unit ribbon cutting. That's a mouthful happening on October 25th at the Ag Agricultural History Farm Park. Um, so that is a super exciting um, project that's been in the works and Lorian has worked closely on that. So um, she can give any more details if she'd like, but um, just something uh, to keep on your calendar, as well as the first Moco Made Mixer is happening on November 14th. So save the date for that. It's going to be at Baby Cat Brewery in Silver Spring. So we hope folks can come out and it's going to be catered by uh, Little Bites Catering, a Moco Made caterer. So we're super excited to be supporting two Moco Made businesses at once. So come out, support your local Moco made businesses um, come hang out with, with the team and, and some other community leaders. It'll be a really great night um, to get together. And we're also going to be handing out uh, drink tickets. So those will be available as supplies last. So it's going to be a great event all around. So hope to see you there. And we have the local food procurement working group happening on October 17th. Sorry, I'm backtracking a little bit. Um, and we're going to share some survey results, going to hear an update from Ivy Baker uh, from the from Crossroads. He's also going to give an update on the micro hub. So um, lots of great conversations happening. So hope you can join us at all those meetings. And um, first up, we have Leah Hunter. She 
um, just ended her internship uh, with us here at the Food Council, um, but she graciously um, agreed to share and present on issues of land equity in the Montgomery County Agriculture Reserve. Um, so without further ado, Leah Hunter. Thank you. Let me just share my screen real quick. Okay. All right, so yes, yeah, Esther said, I'll be sharing um, some research on issues in, of land equity in the Ag Reserve. Let's see, why it won't go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. So about half of the county's farmland uh, was converted to non-farmer ownership by the 1960s and the 1980s. And as a result, the county lost an average of like 2,346 acres per year. So that is kind of the context behind why the Ag Reserve was created. Um, and then right there to the right, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us are familiar with the Ag Reserve. A lot of you live there. Um, but over to the right is a picture of it, just for your reference. And then in Montgomery County, there's about 10,000 10, people that are employed in farming. And then the average farm size is around 120 acres, which I think is just about just something that you should keep in mind as I go through this presentation. So next, I'm gonna kind of give you a broad timeline of the land shifts um, in Montgomery County and in the Ag Reserve. So first you have the pre-colonial kind of block and you have the Piscataway Kanoi tribal nation living on this land. Uh, the indigenous people affiliated with the Piscataway Kanoi tribal nation lived in the area known as Montgomery County when Europeans first colonized the area in the 1600s. And then you kind of shift to plantation ownerships, the Civil War, before the Civil War and post-emancipation, Black people accounted for about a third of the county's population and white people accounted for the remainder. So now you kind of see that transition from native to black and white, but there's still that kind of stark difference in the numbers of black people and native people still present. After the Civil War, African-Americans suffered from all forms of discrimination, including social housing, education, employment, commerce, health, uh, and the resulting alienship led the, to the creation of these self-reliant kinship communities where Black people live together, farm together, work together uh, in Montgomery County in the land on the Ag Reserve uh, up until the late 19th or in the late 19th century. And a significant part of history of racial injustice and discrimination suffered by African-Americans includes the formation and subsequent decline in some case, cases of the destruction of these kinship communities, which began in the early 20th century. So then that you take the shift to suburbanization where you have redlining, zoning, pro, uh, prohibiting development, like a bunch of different things that are keeping black people from being able to own land and also move to that land in the ag reserve and redlining, which I think is a phrase that people might hear a lot but not fully know what it means, is the practice of denying people access to credit because of where they live, even if they are personally qualified for loans. So it's like banks, people that work at banks, strategically preventing people who live in a certain area code or have a certain background from purchasing or from getting loans to be able to purchase land in other neighborhoods. So it's a very like systemic structural issue. Um, historically, mortgage lenders widely redlined core urban neighborhoods and black populated neighborhoods. And then now you're seeing that redlining go into suburbanization and then also rural agricultural land. So then next we jump into the decline or the increase, sorry, of the white population in Montgomery County and the Ag Reserve while also having the decline, which I just explained, of the black population in Montgomery County. So between 1940 and 1960, the white population increased more than fourfold from almost 75,000 people to 327,000 people. And the black population at that time only increased from about 9,000 people to around 13,000 people. So with that historical context, seeing how the land has shifted from native to plantations, to black, to white, to white, 
er, uh, that is where the Agriculture Reserve was made. The Agricultural Reserve was enacted in 1980 and cemented racial segregation as many Black rural communities within it had been depopulated and its zoning requirements prohibit the development of new affordable multifamily housing units. So even as people are, like, even as suburbanization is happening across all races, people are moving from D.C., uh, from large cities, from Baltimore, uh, and suburbanizing, the land on the ag reserve was excluded from that through zoning which you know it was the reason that it happened was to like the reason given is to protect farmland to protect food production which are all positive reasons but then you also have to realize that there's other consequences to that shift so now i want to get into like the numbers to kind of back up uh the discrepancies that i think we all kind of think are there but just to show you that they really are there. If you look at this chart right here, the blue is showing you the 2017 ag census data and the red is showing you the 2022 ag census data. And you can see just the stark difference between the populations of all other demographics versus white people. And then you can see that there are no, there's no number for native people in 2017 and 2022. Um, yeah, I think that one kind of speaks for itself. So then now this is another uh, kind of just honing in on the data is the farm slash agriculture, the farm ownership of land versus the actual demographic of Montgomery County as a whole. So as you can see on the right, you know, people talk about how Montgomery County is like a place where immigrants come. It's very diverse. You walk, you walk anywhere in the county. You can see so many different types of people. And on the right, that kind of shows that you have the large populations of Black, Asian, Hispanic people, along with white people. But then when you look on the left, that is the uh, farm ownership land, and you can see that that diversity is not reflected in the farm ownership land. And this is all for 2022. So it's 95% white ownership versus the other side. And so next, um, I'm getting into comparing Montgomery County against neighboring counties. Um, the graph on the left shows this, they show the same information, the two graphs, one on the left shows it in percentages, which I think is visually, for me, if you're able to tell kind of the breakdown, compare them easier because the other one's just like a long line of color. Um, so from this, you can see that within, within the surrounding counties of from Montgomery County, they all kind of have the same demographic breakdown. You can see that Prince George's County has what seems to be a little bit more diversity in farm ownership compared to the other counties, but they all have like a very clear white supermajority of farm ownership. So when I get into the next slide, this is just to show the PG County breakdown of like why we may have had those discrepancies. Uh, PG County is over 50% Black or African American compared to Montgomery County, which I saw earlier, which was about like 70% or 70% white. So yeah, that's just a little explanation of that. So now there's this idea that, that people have used to, to come up with an explanation to why these discrepancies exist. And it's that other races in Montgomery County are not trying to farm. They're not trying to buy land in the ag reserve. And I think that that's something that we see evidence that I've provided evidence against. And then I'm sure that each of you probably have personal evidence against. Um, these three articles that I show or Three clips just show different groups of people trying to push back on this. Uh, the NPHC's National Pan Hellenic Conference, which is like historically black uh, fraternities and sororities, doing work to increase black farm ownership and black farmers in Montgomery County. And then we have Dodo Farms, which is a farm that most of us are probably used to because they've had a lot of uh, overlap with the Food Council. Um, and I have a quote from Tope from Dodo Farms. And she says, for those who rent, if the landowner closes the space or shuts off the water, you have no control. 
You also can't do as much as you would like to do as a farmer of color without the support, land, and financial resources. Farming, more so than any other industry, requires land, labor, and capital. We don't own the land, we don't have access to labor, and access to capital is a challenge. Buying power is low, making it very difficult to reign for people of color. That is why most Black people don't stay in the ag reserve. And then, sadly enough, Dodo Farms had to move their operations out of Montgomery County because they couldn't find land to own instead of lease within the county. And this is just to even more solidify this idea that people in Montgomery County that are not white do not want to uh, farm. You have the, like, you, Montgomery County's 35% of the residents are foreign born and you're getting farmers, you're getting agricultural workers, food producers from other countries who would like to use their skill set, their knowledge to be able to come to this country to make money and can't do it because there's not the infrastructural support available for them to continue farming once they get here. So next I have just the definition of structural racism, which I'm about to get into. Structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which society fosters racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice. These patterns and practices in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources. So now the big, the big kind of case in structural racism in the United States is Pigford v. Glickman. It was a class action lawsuit uh, against the U.S. Department of Agriculture for Black farmers. They found that they were Black farmers were not receiving fair treatment when they applied to local county committees, which make the decisions for farm or loan assistance. And USDA was found to be guilty of all this, and they had to. Um, repay and uh, all these farmers back. And even with the repayment that they were doing for the discriminatory practices that they were doing, the USDA found a way to like discriminate and hold back these uh, lawsuit payments. So now just to bring that idea home more, you can see this is the acreage ownership by demographic in Montgomery County. And I said earlier that the average farm size is 120 in Montgomery County. And you can see here that the only demographic that makes that average, that can like meet that threshold of the average is white people and men. And everyone else is way below it. And this is assumed to be, although this is the acreage for Montgomery County, it's assumed to be the same in the Ag Reserve in the office of Racial Equity and Social Justice has decided that. So this is a case from the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice that, well, it was a memorandum that they did, a racial impact analysis that they did a couple of years ago. And kind of a good quote that I pulled out of this is, additionally, there's a lot of structural racism in the system. When Black farmers do go get resources, the first thing you're met with is a list of reasons why they won't succeed. However, there should be more focus on the reasons why it is possible, encountering barrier after barrier and hearing no several times, the psychological consequences, even when the grant or opportunity is easy. The gatekeepers have already subconsciously instilled in us that we can't cross the gate, so we don't even want to go ask for that great gate, grant, land, or opportunity. Um, and that, that is another quote from Tope from Dodo Farms. But then on the slide, I have this case that is about easement things that would help farmers in the ag reserve if they had over 50 acres of land. And as I showed you in the, the slide before, the only farmers that have, by average, over 50 acres of land is white farmers. And I think that just kind of brings that structural racism argument home is that even within things in Montgomery County that we have, we have the ag reserve, it's created. And now we're in this position where we can help the farmers who are there and help farmers across the county. But structurally, the only people that can benefit from those efforts to help are still white people. And that is all I have to share. I'd, I have like five more minutes to answer questions. And unfortunately, I have to hop off, but I'd love to answer any questions. 
Leah, thank you so much for um, your presentation. Um, just so much to really ponder on and reflect on. So thank you for your time and effort on putting this together and sharing it with everyone. We really appreciate it. I know I before you go, some folks were, um, Elsh Elshan, I'm sorry, I hope you're saying your name right. Leah, thank you for your presentation. It's interesting to see the diversity ratios in these graphics. And um, yeah, does anyone have any questions for Leah before she has to go? I do. Oh, okay, uh, I don't know who said that, sorry. Uh, Serge Thomas, I'm sorry, I got on late. Oh, oh no problem, sure, um, you can go I'm ahead. With with MAFRAC. Um, I do have a question. Um, what kind of legislation, Leah, do you know it has been proposed or what kind of policy actions has have been taken to try to increase um, opportunities for land ownership and even access to capital and credit to purchase land uh, within the Montgomery County uh, Ag Reserve? Because it sounds like though, rhetorically speaking, uh, most people agree that this kind of uh, imbalance is wrong and the difficulties should not be there. Operationally speaking, people behave uh, otherwise. Uh, thank you for your time and also thank you for your hard work on this. Yeah, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't have a full and complete answer for you. Um, I think what I was focused mostly on in my research was finding attempts at helping people have land and do uh, and be able to use their land to their fullest ability or even just get it and that actually not being fully helpful for all people. So I think that any type of legislation that people are pushing needs to go through offices like like how the Office of Social, uh, Racial Equity and Social Justice did where they did like an impact analysis on it uh, by race. Things like that need to happen to the legislations that we think of so that we even though we have good intentions, that they're actually helpful for all people. If that makes sense. Thank you. And then uh, Linda, you have your hand up. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, hi, Delegate Linda Foley, representing the Ag Reserve in the General Assembly. Um, so my question, Leah, thank you for this research. It's very uh, impactful and interesting uh, and concerning. Um, my question is on your data what did, did was this just this was just farms like this didn't include for example poolsville um which is like in the heart of the ag reserve which does have a little more diversity um i mean they don't own farms but and i don't have the exact data but my sense is, is that there are more there is more diversity in land ownership in poolsville itself I just wondered if that was factored in here and whether or not, um, uh, I mean, there is a history of um, of, of some uh, very important uh, freed slave communities in the Ag Reserve. And I don't know if that um, plays a role, could play a role, because I know, for example, you know, there are some people of color living in those communities, those historic communities. And I just wondered if there was, you know, if you, I'd like you to comment on all of that, if you could, thank you. Yeah, so I, the data that I got was Montgomery County as a whole, and then also one Montgomery County as a whole, and then Montgomery farm ownership as a whole. And then that also brings up another issue with like demographics and all that, because it does only count the land owner, which is oftentimes like people lease, people, uh, are relatives of the person who owns the land. So it really only counts that one person. Um, so that could also be like a discrepancy in the data versus what you're seeing. Yeah, I hope that kind of answered your question. And I think I have time for one more question that unfortunately I have to go. Yes, thank you so much, Leah. Let me check the chat. The, Michelle Nelson said, does Montgomery County have, oh, uh, I don't know if that was directly to you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Leah while we still have her? Ellen, I see you have your hand up. I just, and you sort of touched on this, Leah, 
you're I absolutely the structural inequities are are very present, but I think because so much farming in the ag reserve goes on on leased land, it would be really interesting to know whether that just is unbalanced. Um, yeah, and that was something that we wanted to look into for this, but it's just like you can't find the data on uh, leased land, especially because not all of it's official. So I think that is a step in the future to continue this type of research if someone wanted to pick it up. But yeah, it was great talking to all of you. If you have any questions for me, I can drop my email in the chat and I'd be happy to keep talking with you about it. Wonderful. Thank you, Leah, for your presentation and your time. And thank you. The email is in the chat. So if folks want to follow up um, with Leah. Well, thank you. We will continue that conversation after um, our two other presenters. So please um, hang on and, and try to remember your thoughts. Next up, we will have a, a discussion led by uh, Tramfina Choti and uh, founder and CEO of AfroThrive. Afro She's going to lead a discussion on racial and ethnic disparities in accessing farmland in Montgomery County. So... Jamfina, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for uh, allowing me to be part of this discussion and to Leah for setting the stage. I think the discussion that um, the presentation from Leah is deep, and I think it gives us a chance to reflect. And especially, you know, when we take the accolades being the most diverse count in the nation. We are leading in the nation where three of our cities are in the top. And uh, she mentioned a point where 35% of our residents are foreign born. That trickles down to diversity in food. And then when it comes to where we are, the figures that she has already represented presented here, it tells a different story. And that's the story where every thrive as an organization finds itself. We did not do a scientific research like her before we started, but it was part of our experience settling in Montgomery County about 20 years ago as a graduate student with a young family, a young mother looking for food for her children. We couldn't find the kind of food. There are many times I could go to Chai and just kind of looking for familiar food and I couldn't find. And so that is the journey that starts with every thrive. And so started with community gardening. I'm glad, Michelle, you're here. The Montgomery County uh, Community Gardening Program was a savior for me because that's how I started growing culturally appropriate food that I needed and bringing people because I was tired of uh, sending you know, messages to my mom in Kenya, like, can you dry the food and send me dry food? I cannot afford that, you know, and that is brings us to starting Avery Thrive to connect uh, with immigrant farmers. And so for us to be able to diversify food production, we need to diversify land ownership. We, Avery Thrive, we have a cultural farm in Pulseville, that is the courtesy of a farmer who has graciously given us that space to operate. But then in the arrangement is short term. And in the arrangement, you cannot really build infrastructure in that because it's private land, it's short term. And then when you turn, you want to build a water, cold storage. You know, the state, the county wants you to have that sustainability for 15 years. And you can show that. So it, it, it's a limitation. And then now you start the county, the county does in her own land. It's the state. The state doesn't want to give land because they're all this. So where do we get the people land? 
so that they can grow culturally appropriate food. And I think that's the discussion we need to entertain. And as an experience of Avery Thrive, we have uh, a USDA grant to support black farmers in the county. They're, they're handful, you can count. And all of them, none owns land. They are leasing land. And the landowners decide, mm, I'm not renewing. I don't want you next to here, here because of X, Y, Z. Or you literally can't find that much for the land. So what do you do? And we have people waiting to be part of the cohort of the farmers, but they don't have access to land. So where can we find land in the county? Because if we have people with a strong farming background from their home countries, but then they cannot find land, they cannot find financial credit to start off and produce food we desperately need. What do we need to do? So that is, that's the set that I want us to interrogate in these discussions, because we need to build sustainable farming ventures. There are people who are willing to enter into that. We also need a space to have that incubator uh, farm where these farmers can come, have a feel what it means to nurture the vegetables they want to grow and see, is it profitable? No, it's not profitable, but how can we support them to grow food for the diverse population we have in the county? So that's where as Avery Tribe, we find ourselves and the fight goes on. So I bring it here for all of us to just uh, contribute as a setup, like where do we take the farmers who want to grow food and they don't have land? Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. You folks have... Um... Any thoughts, discussions on that? Somebody's asking, yes, we have a website. I'm going to type it here, it's www.avrithrive.org. So I'm going to type it here so you can access our website and see uh, what we do there. Um, yes, and we have, we have, we have a really need for uh, sustainable um, farming. Uh, places, county, do you have land? State, do you have land? Where is the, where is the <laughs> corporations, do you have land? Because all oh, we're looking, and again, creating the agri was a great idea. Uh, but let me tell you, agri is not accessible. If you are in mid-county, east county, you are committing one hour of commute one way to get to the farm and another hour. Who has that? You cannot get labor to come and work for you because this is not accessible. Is there a way we can get land where people live mm -hmm. so that we can start to grow food in areas that are accessible? That's the question that I'll put like as we pond out, engage with our policymakers in terms of zoning, because zoning is also a contributory factor. If we can get everybody in the agri south, can we at least have land in Mid County, East County, where we have high in uh, food insecurity so that we can get people food they need? Hmm. Yeah. Yes, Esther. Yes, no, Derek brought up a, a good point. This is, I was thinking of Coiner Farm. He said the example of farm in an accessible area is Coiner Farm in Silver Spring. Mm -hmm. So that model of being integrated within your community and neighborhoods surrounding the farm. Tony said Button Farm is on state land. Oh, Button Farm is on state land with a long-term lease. There are opportunities in state land. We are at Button Farm we mm -hmm. at Button Farm may be able to offer land to farmers under our lease. We are in the ag reserve. And um, Tony put an okay. email. 
That's great. That's a great idea. We can we can reach out to Button Farm and see what they have. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Lori Savage said Parks is beginning to realize that most of their leases on larger tracks are larger commodity farmers and hopefully are turning the tide on their thinking. Mm. Yeah. And Esther, might I also add, you know, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Trufina, for sharing, you know, your story on your land um, and your thoughts about that. Because I think, you know, it's just so important to remember that, you know, we also are amidst, I mean, putting this into also the context of like, we're amidst this, you know, ongoing crisis of our food supply chains where we need to like think very you know openly and honestly and clearly about our preparedness as a county to feed our population and at the same time we in the Montgomery in Montgomery County are so lucky to enjoy a diverse you know population of people many of whom have grown up on a farm and have experience on farms and then they relocated here to Montgomery County and you know, we need to, to also, I think the most important thing is to point out that, you know, we have a diversity of the farming community here, but it's, it's, it's very tenuous to hold on to land. And you point out something important to Fina that it's, um, you know, if the, the landowner, like when I was farming, if the landowner decides to discontinue your lease, mm -hmm. you then have all this capital investment that you put into that farm that you lose. So it's a huge risk to the farm in an already risky commercial enterprise. It's a huge risk to the farm to actually like lease land in the first place. And second of all, then you're not eligible for all those programs when you lease um, and you, you have, um, you are not accruing, uh, accumulating wealth into the land. So the best thing is land ownership, even though leasing is a very important step in farming and should be, you know, obviously like we need to, that needs to be available to farmers as well for beginning farmers. Um, and I just think it's just, you know, the ongoing like kind of dichotomy, the, the ongoing tension between, you know, leasing, it's just the best thing is farm ownership, but secondarily leasing is so important. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we will continue that conversation um, at the end of our next presentation. We have um, Christina Bostic, Senior Conservation Associate with the Montgomery Countryside Alliance, and she's going to present on resources for BIPOC farmers in Montgomery County. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, I want to take very, very little of our time um, because I think our time can be best used responding to what Trufina and Leah have, have raised. Um, I wanted um, greetings from the Ag Reserve first off. Um, I'm Christina Bostic. I'm with Montgomery Countryside Alliance. We are the small but mighty nonprofit that uh, protects our agricultural reserve. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to talk about this uh, today. Um, I'm here ostensibly to share uh, our BIPOC resource page. I'm going to pop that in the chat to save us some time. Um, that is a document um, that we hope is a living, breathing uh, document that more and more is added to with um, opportunities for financing for BIPOC farmers, different ways to get that land, get that infrastructure, get that training. Um, and that is in partnership with uh, our Office of Ag Services. Um, I wanna speak a little bit to what Leah was saying. It is uh, in fact the, as, as she was saying, it is not the case that uh, BIPOC farmers are not seeking land. Um, we run a land link program, which I will also pop in the chat for time, um, that is helping folks um, find long-term leases on uh, with landowners in the ag reserve in the county. Um, that's something that you know we were able to help Dodo Farms find a spot, Trufina's uh, cultural farm in Poolsville. Uh, we realized this is a stopgap measure. 
um, you know, we have been able to match farmers with land, but, um, you know, in, in Trufina's situation, they want more land, they need more water, they want somewhere that they can put down roots quite literally and put down infrastructure to help grow those roots. And that's, um, that's imperative. That's important. Um, I want to let folks know that in 2012, with parks, uh, Montgomery Countryside Alliance and some other partners worked to create an incubator uh, project, uh, just the framework of it, um, that was a plan that was shelved. Um, it did not go forward, but we got as far then as identifying certain parks areas. And um, it's critical what Trufina is talking about in terms of there, there has to be that spot that's sort of Goldilocks in terms of having viable farmland close to places where you can find labor, close to places where people live um, and um, figuring out where that can be. But there is a plan that I think life can be breathed back into that involves finding space on parkland that could host some of these incubator projects. Um, I'm gonna get busy putting things uh, in the chat that I was talking about, also my contact, but want to save as much time as possible to um, respond to what Trufina and others have, have been saying. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Does anyone want to open up the discussion q and I, I know Leah hopped off the call, but we can um, continue that conversation as well. And if you have any questions for Tofina. I sure, go ahead, Ellen. Um, I've been involved in a fair number of discussions about uh, how difficult it is to find land for um, uh, farmers starting out, and it has a lot to do with, I mean, there are definitely racial inequities, but um, regardless of color, there are difficulties. Land is really expensive in Montgomery County. And I'm just curious, I personally have come to the conclusion that we're going to need a different model. And it could be something like a um, an agrarian trust um, in perpetuity with some land, you know, if some wealthy person wanted to donate a big chunk of land, whatever, if, uh, you know, it, it involves some philanthropy to get it started, but that that's going to be the answer, both for beginning farmers and farmers continuing is, um, and, the, and, and structured so that you do get long-term leases and um, you are part of the infrastructure for the place. And I don't know what anybody else thinks of that idea, um, uh, but I just, I don't know. I, I don't think there's not really any way to make buying land more affordable in this county. So if we want farming to happen here, we have to do something innovative and creative in a land model. Yeah. May I ask one question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Trofina, have, have, has your organization ever done any research on modular farming systems like um, hydroponics, aquaponics, because that way you don't need to install anything in the soil, but there are some regulatory constraints which we're trying to handle at our farm. But I think it can be replicated as long as we have access to funds that would encourage other farmers to join um, us because we don't have enough to supply our customers. Maybe that model would work for people who have land, but they don't want to have installations on this on that land. Um, have you ever thought about it? Like, uh, yes. Thank thank you so much. And I want to uh, let me respond to Ellen, and then I come back to you. Uh, I think, uh, Ellen, I think we need a political will to make land available. Montgomery County land is available, it's expensive, but it's available. And I think if we get a political will, it's going to happen. The reason I say so is because uh, Peachy County has a nice model that they have an incubator farm 
that the farmers who are beginning to grow have access to land where they can. Why can we have? Because I, I in the records, and I think uh, Christina mentioned and she knows about this, the Parks Department in 2010 did a model for us to have uh, incubator farms. That proposal is still sitting somewhere. I have a copy. Why can't we, in that spirit of 2010, help parks and recreation identify spaces where this model farm could be in an accessible place and we get people there? PG County is doing it and I think we can do it. So I think it's we're lacking the political will to diversify the farming access. And I think that's where we are. We need to move from the large tracts of land that are chemically driven, that are killing people. I realized, you know, recently that deers don't go to some farms because those farms are using chemicals in their products and the deer does not want. But I'm telling you one time in Poolsville, the deers recently, last week, they just opened when the wind came down and our fence went down. I'm telling you the damage they did to our uh, vegetables. So you can see there's a difference. And if we want to heal people and get people healthy, we need to get away from the chemicals and get food that is naturally grown that you can eat. And I think that's where we need to, do we want to prevent diseases or do we want to be feeding people food that makes them sick? And that's where the political will Ellen, comes. And I, I think I need to entertain that topic. And going to Asia's question, did I pronounce it right? Is Asian? We have considered that uh, the hydroponics uh, situation as part of it, but also what reminds us is hydroponics is using chemicals to have the plants grow. And so I, we, we we welcome the study that shows that how what's the impact of these chemicals that make the plant grow? What's its long term impact on people's bodies? So that is where we are because our our vegetables are naturally grown, no chemicals, no fertilizers, just having the the the, the regular compost and 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 we grow that and we believe that's how we can build healthy bodies, but then. How do we navigate where land is not accessible and use the urban model to get there? Should we start people having baskets do or whatever, buckets or whatever, where they are to grow? But that's a challenge. But I think we can have this robust discussion and, and find a solution because we can't sit any longer. That's, that's, that's my point I'll put out. Thank you. One one comment on this: uh, we do, we grow aquaponically. We don't grow hydroponic. We don't use chemical fertilizers. We use fish poop and pee as a fertilizer, and and only carbonates, which is organic matter, um, to grow both crops like fish and plants. And you're welcome to visit us anytime you want, just to see how we how we do this practice on site. Thank you, Shan. Drop me your email, then I can follow up. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for putting that. It's Echo City, yes. Echo City is in Peachy County and it's a collaboration between the county and and, and, and the, the organization, Echo City. And they have, why can't we have a model of Echo City in Montgomery County? Lorianne? Sure. And, you know, Elshan brings up a good point. And I think like that's something that, um, you know, I think it comes up quite a lot, you know, sort of in terms of like, well, how do we make the best use of the, the limited land we have to make it the most productive as possible? And I just want to speak from my perspective when I was farming in the Ag Reserve and, you know, I had five acres and looking at you know, priced out something for aquaponics, right? And I'm looking, I'm super interested in it. I've gone through the workshops. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it. And I priced out the equipment and it's just like, there's no way I can afford any of that. Um, so I just want to say, you know, I feel like the, in the, the conversation about aquaponics and hydroponics always has to keep in mind that the equipment itself is 
is is very expensive and has to be maintained on an ongoing basis. And there are certain things that, you know, um, I know I've seen studies about this and lived through it myself, where it is the, there's a reason why beginning farmers tend to do annual vegetables outdoors in certain ways. And it's because that's a very low cost crop, you know, very low cost to start. Um, but if you do have investment capital and you are on a very small piece of land in a more urban dense area, hydroponics and aquaponics tends to make sense. Um, but if you're on five acres of just, it's already, it's already an, a, a farm field where you've already worked out your irrigation, then it seems like it's, it makes more sense to go annual vegetables under the sun, you know, not covered where it's, um, you know, where it's, it's irrigated, um, you know, just via something like drip tape or something, which is lower cost to get started. So it's, um, I feel like we should have this conversation about aquaponics and hydroponics, but uh, in Montgomery County, it, in the dense urban areas, that's an urban farming thing. Um, so, you know, again, like we're lucky in Montgomery County to have these large tracts of land, but what to do with them? Yeah. Um, and personally, what we're always talking about is these commodity farms take uh, are taking they they do they, they take lots of space for the corn and soy rotation that they have. And one thing to point out is that much of that is going straight to the port and being exported. So it doesn't, unfortunately, mm -hmm. while it benefits the farmers themselves and they're selling their product, it doesn't enter our food system. Even yeah. when it enters our food system, it's usually to the, say, to feed chickens in the chicken houses on the eastern shore, which is something mm -hmm. that, you know, again, and those chickens are not necessarily sold locally. So, um, you know, I think part of it for me is thinking, how can we grow on these large tracts of land and have it actually enter our local food system? Yes. And also just wanted to comment, uh, based on Emma's comment, on about uh, managing of uh, incubator. And I wanted to share that for every thrive is in that to help the beginner farmers uh, start on and help them work. Right now, we have a bending USDA grant for that work, but we have to show them we have access to land and we have up to the end of November to show that we have access to land to get that grant. So it's it's the funding is available and uh, our team is available, but we don't have the land. At least we need land where we can put 20 families to grow food. And we have until the end of next month. Um, I am looking through the chat for any other comments or questions. I know we have just three minutes left. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, Mafoy, Mafoy uh, asked a question. Um, I believe the land it's so for purchase for disability community as they have limited employment agriculture is a broad industry where do i begin um um this is derek i can speak to that um that that last one um okay. i know red wiggler farm is doing something somewhat similar so that um uh, he could be a resource there in terms of just figuring out some ways to take a first step. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, I hope you got that, um, Mafoy and your Red Wiggler. Um, awesome, well, I see still some comments coming in through the chat. Uh, I just wanna say thank you so much to our presenters, Leah, Christina, and Jofina for um, their presentations and discussions. Um, it's been really wonderful and to hear just um, all the work that's being done and just the long way that we have to go. Lorian, I, I see you have your hand up, sorry. You know, I just, I'm left with like this thought that I know this was the thought that Leah left us with, which is, you know, we really have to look at each policy and programming initiative and really look at, look at that through the lens of the, um, doing an equity analysis of each one, you know? so. I feel like that's kind of our job, people on this call, is to you know look at like basically um, 
the reports from like the racial equity and social justice office and say, okay, well, each thing, each solution that we come up with, how does that impact different demographics? And, um, you know, in our ongoing effort to try to increase food production in the agri -surf. So I think that's like, for me, one of the biggest takeaways. And, um, you know, just uh, we are going to continue this conversation. And um, I just want to say thanks to all our presenters and thanks for everybody on this call. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And we will send you all a uh, write-up uh, of the